We are in Indonesia on the Indian Ocean. This group of eight French people have been on the go for 30 hours, but no one is planning on sleeping. They have one aim, to get near Krakatoa, a mythical volcano which killed 40,000 people when it erupted in 1883. Their guide is Guy de Saint-Cyr, who's been climbing volcanoes for 58 years. According to him, the volcano is active. But will they see an eruption? The volcano is spitting out plumes of gas. Over the next three days, these enthusiasts will get as close to the crater as they can. The boat reaches the foot of the volcano, a dangerous place. <laughs> the boulders or bombs which are falling into the sea are solidified lava. Night falls fast and the incandescence of the boulders is increasingly visible. They shoot up hundreds of meters and fall at over 200 kilometers an hour. If one hit you, you'd be killed. But that doesn't stop our team from going ashore. <laughs> the volcano is part of an uninhabited archipelago. Officially, no one is allowed to approach at present. It's too dangerous. But they're going to sleep under canvas or in a hammock on this active volcano. <laughs> Suddenly, the earth starts to tremble. Ça tombe pas loin, hein? C'est derrière la forêt. Mais c'est terrifiant de dormir à côté de ça. Ah ouais, mais t'as l'ambiance là. Tu sens la terre qui vit là. Toutes les 20 minutes, tu vas avoir ta petite pété qui va te tenir en éveil. <laughs> But Isabel isn't afraid. Quite the opposite. The group are eager for thrills. Despite being tired, everyone gets ready. Gas mask, helmet, a well-practiced ritual, more or less. <laughs> but don't be fooled by appearances. This group are all regulars. Attendez tout le monde. To climb up an active volcano, experience is paramount. Ne soyez jamais très près les uns des autres. Laissez toujours entre vous au moins 3-4 mètres. De façon que si jamais, si jamais il y avait des, des retombées de bombes qui arrivent vers vous, surtout ne partez pas en courant. Tonight, these enthusiasts will risk their lives to get close to an eruption. In recent years, a niche activity has been developing in the leisure industry. It's called extreme tourism. Volcano and tornado hunters, people who travel to war zones and ultra-sporty travelers. They're all adrenaline seekers. We followed these holidaymakers who are prepared to risk their lives in the name of fun. In Afghanistan, we watched an intense skiing competition. In a country in chaos. Between Kabul 
and the remote Banyan Mountains. The adventurers will discover a different world. In Indonesia, Guy de Saint-Cyr lives to explore active volcanoes. Comme si quelque chose à la vie, Their one obsession to get ever closer and take home extraordinary photos. The volcano hunters want more. On est peut-être un peu maso, quoi, mais on veut encore des marques au fer rouge. In Chernobyl, in the most dangerous zones, Romain and David will have to survive all by themselves. War tourism, nuclear tourism, disaster tourism. This is extreme traveling. We're back in Indonesia, 160 kilometers east of Jakarta, and Krakatoa is still erupting. The group is leaving the forest at the foot of the volcano. They could be crushed by lava bombs at any moment. Voilà une bombe qui est tombée il y a peu de temps. Voilà. Vous voyez, elle s'est cassée en deux. The impact has made craters all around. D'ailleurs, regardez, celui-là, il est tout récent. Mais ça, c'est des blocs qui peuvent faire 2-3 tonnes hein, qui, peuvent, qui tombent là-dedans. 2 to 3 tonnes traveling at over 200 km an hour. Some boulders have started fires just meters from the group. Pour l'instant, l'intensité des explosions nous permet de, de continuer à grimper encore. Maintenant, si ça devait, si ça devait monter en intensité, si les bombes arrivaient plus près, ben à ce moment-là, on verra. It's not just the guide who's excited. No one wants to turn back. Super excitée. Émerveillée là. On se dit qu'on a une chance de fou d'être là. Ouais, c'est un petit peu d'adrénaline, mais enfin, franchement, avec Guy, on, pas moi, je me sens vraiment en sécurité. Il sait s'arrêter. They reach a ridge a few meters from the crater. Elles sont à 30 mètres. Si elles te touchent, elles te massacrent. Waouh Regardez bien au dessus The crackling sound is that of boulders crashing down on the cone again, just meters from the group. Guy still isn't worried. Et franchement, ça serait vraiment pas de chance. Il y a un bloc qui part du cratère qui arrive ici quand même, hein? Juste où on est quand même. <laughs> But several seconds later, a huge eruption bombards the cone. Bombs rain down on the group. Sophie on the right moved just in time. She had a narrow escape. The boulders are heated to over 600 degrees when they come out of the crater, but they quickly cool. Sophie is able to collect a small piece of the fragment which could have killed her. Tout le monde est là? Sophie? Oui, je suis là. Quand j'ai senti l'angle de choc, je me suis dit, oh! et j'ai tourné la tête et j'ai vu le, la roche incandescente en trois morceaux à côté. Je me dis, oups, là j'ai de la chance. <rire> Faut que mon heure n'était pas venue. The last explosion has curbed Guy's enthusiasm. Non, on est trop près. Là, je, on, on regarde encore une explosion et si c'est si c'est comme ça, on rentre. Là. Pourquoi on en regarde une autre alors? Et tout le monde ici a envie d'attendre la prochaine explosion quand même. Ah oui. Tant qu'on gagne, on joue. Hein. <laughs> High on adrenaline, the team decides to stay a bit longer. Allez, une petite dernière. Oh. Attention. Ça arrive au-dessus. They're bombarded again. Ça 
n'allait pas passer une derrière, hein Ouais. The group is surrounded by glowing rocks. Fabrice's camera had a near miss. Luckily, it was still working. Ah non, oh putain. Elle est magnifique. Là, je t'avouerai, euh, on a eu droit à notre frayeur, là. On en rigole, mais à mon avis, demain, quand on prendra du recul, là, ça sera pas la même histoire. On se rendra compte qu'on est passé à côté de quelque chose euh, un peu chaud. Seeing the spectacle up close means taking risks, which the lava hunters certainly did tonight. Alors au craquin, hein? Ouais, au craquin. Il a été quand même vraiment sympa. Hein? Merci au craquin. Merci. Merci. The agency insists people have insurance to go on a trip with Guy. And for this type of adventure, they only take people who know of the dangers. Extreme tourists like to be scared. So what better than visiting a war zone? Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan, Central Asia. One of the most dangerous cities in the world. The Taliban are in danger of regaining control and terrorist attacks are increasing. In 2018, Nearly 4,000 civilians died in Afghanistan, a record. The terrorists are targeting Afghan institutions, diplomatic missions and Westerners in particular. Going to Kabul on holiday is unheard of. Yet Ellen is ready for an adventure. The 52-year-old American loves a challenge. She's already tried to climb Everest three times. A few hours before her flight, she sent us this video. This is the first time I bought KR insurance, which stands for kidnap and ransom insurance. So I've learned that I am now worth a million dollars. A colleague who knows I'm going on this trip, and he said, Ellen, you need to be more worried about this. On leaving the airport, Ellen is met by an agency specializing in war tourism. I mean, I think I'd be lying if I said no. Um, I think this is probably the first one where I've really thought that something bad could actually happen. Charging $2,600 for 10 days, the agency takes care of travel and accommodation. Behind a discreet reinforced gate, our car arrives at the hotel. There is no sign outside, just barbed wire and guard dogs. This week, Ellen will be with two other tourists, William from New York and Inga, a 22-year-old Norwegian. The two men have already had their first scare. We got stopped by the police. Did you like, really? Yeah, yeah. You just got a bit nervous when the military stopped us. And like, you see, like, raising his voice and getting more and more angry, so... I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> By way of a welcome, their guide, Kusar Hussein, gives his clients a warning. The main problem, as I say is to you, is the suicider. So if you have suicider, the security does not help. If you shoot him, it means you are pressing the button of the bomb. So the best way is to keep a low profile. That's why we avoid staying in the mainstream, like high profile hotels. So uh, don't take photo. If you take a photo, they first shoot and then they later ask. Kusor has organized clothing for the tourists. I think it'll be fun. It'll be fun to wear. No, I don't think so. It's super fit. Dressed for adventure, the three tourists are ready for a tour of Kabul. They pass through a city destroyed by a succession of wars. After the war against the Soviets in the 1980s, Kabul was controlled by the Taliban. Since 2001, the city has been run by an international coalition and then by the Americans. Each part of the city tells a story from a particular era. Yeah, this is the swimming pool, the famous swimming pool where Taliban were executing people. Point there, I can tell, not in front of the camera. <laughs> because it's political things, so sometimes... Executions by the Taliban took place in this swimming pool at the end of the 1990s. 
Some were thrown off the diving platform. Today, with the American presence and the threat from the Taliban, Kabul is still a city at war. The persistent stares from the Afghans make Inga nervous. They stare at you so much and they, they don't look happy when they see you. It's mostly angry stares, it feels like. So I'm not quite sure. You don't feel like you belong here, that's for sure. I don't want to stay for too long. Ellen, on the other hand, doesn't feel at all threatened and repeatedly wanders off from the group. Ah. May I try? No. Thank you. No, no, no. Oh, you're so kind. Her traveling companions are growing impatient. Ellen, we have to go. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you, Okay, thank you. Despite the poverty she's seeing, the balloons and the children's fairground rides enchant Ellen. She's delighted. They're going to ask for money. I that. Okay. All right, sweeties, you ready? Here you are. <laughs> An express tour in a city scarred by poverty. <laughs> the next day, the tourists leave Kabul at dawn. They're heading for the Banyan Mountains to the west of Kabul. The purpose of their trip is to take part in a skiing competition in five days' time. A competition that is both extraordinary and timeless. Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Romain and David are 22 and 20, and their passion is urbex, or urban exploration. They seek out places abandoned by humans. No tourist trips for them. The two students wait for nightfall at the hotel. It's midnight. The day can now begin. <laughs> To celebrate the end of their exams, they're not going to the beach or clubbing. Their destination is more radioactive. The Forbidden Zone in Chernobyl, the site of the worst nuclear disaster in history. The 26th of April, 1986. The Soviet Empire's fourth reactor exploded, releasing a huge cloud of radioactive waste all over Europe. Over 9,000 people died and 200,000 were evacuated. The zone is still dangerous and guarded by soldiers. The young French men are going in at night to avoid the Ukrainian police. For safety, our journalists contacted a man who knows Chernobyl well, Igor, dressed in military gear. This unusual guide takes tourists into the forbidden zone for 300 euros. The Forbidden Zone is a two-hour drive north of Kiev. The two friends are off to the unknown. Thanks to the full moon, they can move through the night. They enter the 30-kilometer radius military zone. But Romain and David have a problem. We go 10 kilometers. 10 kilometers. Um, car. This and this car. The guide doesn't speak French, and his English is poor. Communication could be difficult. They'll walk for several hours in silence without knowing where they're going. After three hours walking when day breaks, the atmosphere is increasingly tense. 
The French men can be seen, and police patrols could be anywhere. If they get caught, they'll have to pay a fine, and they'll be deported. On va marcher jusqu'à nuit. Mais c'est l'aube. On essaie de pas faire trop de bruit. Tout ce qu'on a entendu, c'est des chiens au loin. C'est ça. Communicating with the guide remains difficult. This is, this is uh, бесконечная, бесконечная лапа называется. In the middle of the forest, in utter silence, they come across rare vestige of the Soviet era. Barely anything has changed here for 33 years. Breaking into a militarized zone is risky, but for these friends, that's the fun of urban exploration. It's illegal, so... Yes, well, that's better. Otherwise, if it was, it would be more like Chernobyl. You have to have the want to take the risk, that's the thing. We could have been shot by the police several times. But, well, the hasard does not make it. Et du coup, bah, on est chanceux et c'est un peu comme si on était un Disneyland mais vide. Ça. The other risk is an invisible one, radioactivity. The trees here will be contaminated for at least the next 20,000 years. But against all odds, the zone has become a refuge for biodiversity. As these photos show, nature is reasserting itself. It's 8 o'clock and they need to find somewhere to sleep. Using a Geiger counter, Romain checks the radiation. 027, on pourrait dire que c'est trois fois plus que Paris. Trois fois plus de chance que Paris d'avoir le cancer. Bah. Romain and David will spend three days alone in the Chernobyl forest. Meanwhile, on Krakatoa in Indonesia, things are calmer. The adventurers emerge after a dangerous night. The weather is good. The group goes off to observe the volcano from the boat. La première crête, regarde, tu la vois là La crête où on était cette nuit là. They're all thinking about last night's scare. Guy is being more sensible today. Si on remonte ce soir, on montrera la sortie de la forêt. Pas plus. Today, the group is more cautious. The crater shouldn't be approached during the day. The sunlight makes the glowing boulders and the approaching danger harder to see. But one person is less prudent. Covered in ash and scratches, Anton, a young Russian, is very excited. He climbed almost to the top of the volcano. It's first volcano. Be careful, it's dangerous. Yeah, a little dangerous, but I like. Anton seems a little reckless. His nonchalance shocks the group. I think it's the video that will end up on YouTube or something like that. Yeah, it's maybe to make some images a bit more strong, to put it on the social media. He's going to do it on YouTube. We don't know if there's a dead guy here soon. Unlike the Russian, they're waiting until the light fades. But the group cracks before nightfall and decides to go beyond the forest. Partir de là, regardez bien, hein. Dès qu'il y a eu d'explosion, regardez, ne bougez plus, regardez. The thinking within the group varies. Behind Guy, some stop short. They know the risks. Je monte pas moi. Je sais pas prudent. Je sens pas. C'est pas prudent parce que je sens pas du tout. 
ça pète beaucoup plus qu'hier. Half the group refuse to go any further. On fait sécession. On adore ça, mais je le sens pas. Hier, on s'est bien amusé, on a eu de la chance. Moi, je préfère rester à peu près à ce niveau-là pour euh, éviter tout risque inutile. Guy promised he wouldn't go back up to the ridge. But there he is, in the exact same spot where we were bombarded the day before. The guide has been climbing volcanoes for 58 years. He's burned his feet in lava and narrowly escaped death several times. There's relief when he returns. On a eu quelques émotions, c'est vrai. Et ça aussi, c'est pas mal. Je vous ai expliqué ce matin qu'à partir d'ici, il y a un risque certain. Donc vous avez bien fait pour monter. Alors vous allez me dire, mais moi, pourquoi je suis monté Je peux pas vous expliquer. C'est un moment de vie, un moment... Je sais pas. Comme si j'arrachais quelque chose à la vie, quoi, tu vois Quelque chose de fort, quoi. At 80, the guide seems blinded by his passion. J'ai eu des amis qui sont morts sur les volcans, qui sont morts suite à une éruption. C'est une mort qui est, qui est tout à fait possible. Et je, je, je dirais même que je souhaite cette mort plutôt que de mourir d'une maladie dans un, dans un lit d'hôpital. Hein. Les, les volcans, ils m'ont donné tellement de bonheur, tellement de joie que le jour où ils vont me, ils vont me reprendre, et ben ma foi, ils m'ont tellement donné que je trouve que c'est normal. C'est pas grave. Tu vois, aujourd'hui, moi, je suis pas monté parce que voilà, je connais les limites du truc. C'est c'est cette expérience qui fait aussi que voilà, on, après, on prend. Et puis, c'est de moins prendre de risques sur un volcan. Une petite Emma, puis une petite femme aussi. Bah voilà, c'est ça. Hein, tu viens de te marier, ça, ça joue aussi, ça. Et euh, bah voilà, quand, quand je me suis couché hier soir, j'ai directement pensé à ma fille. Et... Voilà. Once again, the volcano hunters have given themselves a real fright. But that's what they came for. Je me suis chargé en énergie là, ça, sur le volcan. Et maintenant, je suis détendu, je suis bien. Ça va. On est marqué au fer rouge. C'est des grands moments de bonheur et on en voit encore quand on, veut... on est peut-être un peu maso, quoi, mais on voit encore des marques au fer rouge. Ouais, c'est ça. C'est ça. On va être maso, hein. on en voit encore. On veut se faire peur. Elle a d'un seul coup. Les aventuriers planent de revenir soon. But Krakatoa won't look the same. A catastrophe will change the geography of the region. Meanwhile, in the Banyan Mountains of Afghanistan, the international competition is approaching. The army is on alert. With the presence of tourists comes an increased risk of attack. Banyan, west of Kabul, is known for its giant Buddhas, dating back to the third century, which were destroyed by the Taliban in 2001. 18 years later, the niche of the great Buddha is still empty and the region remains very poor. But our tourists are not here for that. We catch up with the group as they begin their training for the competition. And they're not the only ones preparing. The competition is here too. Sajad, our guide, has even found them some second-hand skis. Those uh, skis cannot be used in Europe. They donated to Bamiyan and then still they can use them. It's better than the wooden skis they have. There are no ski runs here either. They attach their skis on the road and improvise. Oh, we're going to do a little longer warm-up than we anticipated. <laughs> Nothing unusual here. Just probably another day in Afghanistan. The Banyan Mountains are at the end of the Himalayan range, with 40 peaks at more than 4,500 meters above sea level. The race for which the tourists are preparing consists of ascending and descending a summit. The climb is hard. At this altitude, oxygen levels are low. But 
But the reward comes on the way down as they carve their way through untouched snow. That's yeah, freaking awesome, man. Woo! There is, however, one real ski run in Afghanistan. This year, Sajad, who runs the local ski club, has set up an experiment along with some friends. This is the first ski station in Afghanistan, yeah. Most people, they thought that we have, we need a big, big budget. But we, we made it by only one motorbike and rope and, yeah. One motorcycle, a rope around the wheel, and another wheel at the summit. And they're off on a 280 meter climb at top speed. Ellen, our American, loves it. Another unlikely event in this country is being prepared, a ski championship reserved for Afghan women. The problem is most of the competitors have only just learnt to ski. But there's one champion skier, Fatima. She was among the first female skiers and she's highly ambitious. I want the next time go to the uh, Olympic. I want first girl in Olympic. Several more brave women have followed in her tracks. They're a close-knit team. They have to be in order to face down the disapproval of Afghan society. Roy mara hato mi giriftan, mara azar mi dadan, ba ma jang mi kardan, ke tu chira mi riski, tu ra chi da iski, dukhtar chi ba iski. ولی من مبارزه می کردم. امروز که می رفتم فراموش می کردم. باز فردا همی می شد. فراموش می کردم. حال به حال بهتر شده. حتی امی... چند روز پیش وقتی که می رفتیم لباس اسکی مثل پسرها پیش دا بود اینک زده بود. پسر از پیش منتر شد. یکیش کلا شکش کرد. یکیش اینک شکش کرد. The big day is here. It's six o'clock in the morning. We join Fatima at home, high above Banyan. این کلا اسکی می her older brother lends his support. Since their father died, he is the head of the family. It's time for Fatima to go. <coughs> but first, an important phone call. There are only three hours to go until the championship. At the ski club, Fatima is bursting with excitement. A large crowd has turned out for this, the eighth annual women's event. As expected, they're all men. A handful of women watch from a distance, and naturally, all the tourists are here. It's pretty weird <laughs> to, to imagine there will be a ski competition here, especially for women, but it's cool to see, very cool to see. The sport is in its infancy in this country. The layout of the ski slope is very simple, and all the participants are amateurs. The fact that Afghan women are taking part in such a championship is an event in itself. Fatima wants to win at all costs. The race is about to start and the atmosphere is tense. One by one, the ten competitors make their descent. Now it's the champion's turn.
She's wrong. At 38 seconds 58, she currently holds the best time. Once her sister, the last competitor, arrives, she's sure of winning the title. <laughs> Fatima is officially Afghanistan's female downhill skiing champion for the third year in a row. The other girls' faces are hidden to protect them against fundamentalists. <laughs> Fatima, on the other hand, is a TV sensation. The tourists look on. Soon it will be their turn to take part in this unique competition, the big international race. Americans, Swedes, Canadians, Australians. A dozen of them line up to compete with the Afghans. Back in Chernobyl, there is no competition for the young Frenchman, just a slightly rude awakening. After four hours sleeping in this radioactive forest, the two friends set back out on the road towards the nuclear power plant. They have just one aim, to get close to the remains of one of the nuclear reactors in Pripyat near Chernobyl. But the army patrols are still there. The boys are scared. But they may soon find themselves alone. As agreed in advance, Igor, their guide, is due to leave them here. Before turning back, he shows them the route towards the town of Pripyat, just next to the power plant. On the phone, the map shows a five-hour walk in the most dangerous zone. This is still a Pripyat, but uh, this uh, peak red forest. Very, very big radiation, very big radiation, very fast, very fast. Ah, ça a l'air faisable. En essayant d'esquiver les patrouilles et les voitures de police, mais à l'heure où on arrivera, il devrait plus en avoir beaucoup. On les verra venir de loin, qui fera nuit. David feels it's unrealistic to continue without a guide. Two options, two. As fatigue sets in, the tensions start to show. Non, mais c'est des villes. <laughs> Pas du tout. Tu vas mourir. Mais non. Non, c'est de la marche. Bon, euh, c'est la pleine lune, du coup, de nuit, ça se fait, sans, sans lance. Oh là là, mais... Euh... Even the guide is skeptical and tries his best to dissuade them. Go to Pripyat, no good idea. No good. Non, mais moi, ça me passionne. Wild animal. Uh, police, uh, National Guardia, uh, National Guardia. <coughs> you, uh, uh, you <coughs> no, no, Lacking um, experience, the two young men Guardia. are exposing themselves to many uh, risks. Est-ce que je envoie la chandelle? <coughs> est-ce que je peux pas prendre un tour opérateur à 80 euros la journée? Puis juste y aller une journée, puis voilà. Moreover. There are easier ways to explore this vast area of 2,600 square kilometers. Though some prefer to take the clandestine route, a day-long bus tour is available at a cost of 80 euros. Tourist agencies are allowed access because they work with the army and follow strict regulations. But a night under the stars is off the agenda. We cannot eat outside because outside you increase the possibility to swallow some particles if they travel in the air. But don't put your belongings on the ground. Don't sit anywhere because if your things are contaminated on the way back, we will need to leave them in the zone. In fact, Chernobyl is the most popular tourist activity in Ukraine and a major attraction. 
that every year. A lot. It's hard to say the numbers, but now, for example, it's around 500, 600 people uh, every weekday. On weekends, it's up to 1,000, 1,500 people. It's huge. It's huge, yeah. These 12 tourists of many nationalities have come to see the remains of the worst nuclear disaster in history. All are aware of the scale of the tragedy. When mankind isn't here anymore, it would be probably like this. Is there still inside? The houses were deserted overnight. On leaving, the inhabitants thought they'd be gone for just a few days. The majority didn't survive the radiation. It's estimated that at least 9,000 were killed directly as a result of the disaster. It's a very significant place. Uh, it's like uh, everyone should at least once in their lifetime visit Chernob uh, Chernobyl and the concentration camps. It's, the big human tragedies. And here we can see uh, all the destruction that man can do. But the risks are still there, and measuring the radiation levels is the most popular activity. Metal is particularly dangerous. It is 92. The limit for Ukrainian standards is 0 0.13. It means that we should not spend here too much time. Here too, a little shot of adrenaline doesn't go amiss. Slightly terrified. But radioactivity can also be buried deep in the woods. And just a few kilometers away, the two Frenchmen continue to be exposed to it. They set out 15 hours ago. The guide agreed to accompany them a little further, but the situation is becoming increasingly difficult. We don't have water. It's like actually, if we don't have water, we can't do it. They are now in the middle of Chernobyl's forbidden zone. Will they make it out unscathed? Three weeks after we left Krakatoa on December the 22nd, 2018, an extremely rare geological event took place. An eruption led to the collapse of the volcano, which triggered a tsunami. 600 people were killed and 40,000 evacuated. In the days that followed, the eruptions continued, sending up large clouds of ash. But Guy has only one aim, to lead a group onto the collapsed volcano. At the airport, he meets other regulars who know Krakatoa well. They jump straight on a plane. <laughs> the Indonesian government has imposed a five-kilometer exclusion zone around Krakatoa. The group can't be sure of reaching the volcano. But they eagerly board the boat, regardless of the weather conditions. And while some are suffering from seasickness, the crew realize that the boat has a slight problem. On plein de l'eau. On plein de l'eau. Et on a une panne de moteur. Eventually, the boat restarts. The tourists are soaked, but in good spirits. Five hours later, they finally see it, the new Krakatoa. The entire volcano has collapsed. Oh, the crater, whose mouth once stood at 318 meters, is now at sea level. Where once there was vegetation and a beach, there is now just a pile of ash. Guy is eager to achieve his goal, to be the first person to walk on the still hot volcanic ash.
And sure enough, the French have defied the ban. <laughs> they are the first to walk on the new Krakatoa. Je viens d'assister à un phénomène que je rêvais de voir un jour. Et depuis maintenant 56 ans que je fréquente les volcans, ben c'est la première fois que je vois ça. Oui. <laughs> On l'a eu. On l'a eu. The last eruption was only five days ago, but the group is still keen to tackle the mountain of ash. The terrain is difficult, and they have to find their way through the immense labyrinth. Once at the summit, Guy can hardly believe it. Fabulous. Fabulous. Tu sais ce que je ressens? Comme la première fois que j'ai fait l'amour. La même chose, le même bonheur, la même inquiétude. When I see that, it makes me laugh. I don't want to see it, but it's the same. It's the same, and it makes me enter into it, in the trip, and then... You have to live with it. Let's go, everyone! Thank you! And to the crack! To the crack! And to the crack! While everyone relaxes, their guide remains wary. Là, on est content, on est heureux, tout se passe bien. Mais dans quelques secondes, ça peut, ça peut péter, là. Vous allez résister à descendre Oui. 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 Parce que je ne suis pas seul. Mais une fois, Guy fait l'opposé de ce qu'il dit. Il décide de venir un peu plus loin. Et tout le monde le suit. En fait, pour suivre Guy, euh, je réfléchis un peu à deux fois quand même. Mais on le voit en fait quand il commence à rôder un peu, ça, ça le démange. Et on se dit, bah, ça y est, il nous prépare un, un coup. Quoi. Là, si ça pète, euh, enfin, on sera tous morts. Hein. Ça fait rire Ouais, ça fait un peu rire. Bon, bah, on espère quand même revenir vivant. Quoi. Up ahead, Guy doesn't look reassured either. On est quand même fou. Là, c'est de la folie ce qu'on fait. Eventually, the group stops 100 meters from the crater lake. Guy's addiction has prevailed once again. J'ai vraiment du mal à m'en passer, toi. Là, normalement, j'aurais dû déjà raccrocher, hein. Mais j'y arrive pas. But for as much as this natural spectacle entertains the tourists, the volcano remains deadly. 50 kilometers away, in the fishing village of Kurita, the tsunami triggered by the eruption of Krakatoa destroyed entire families. On returning to the coast, the French visitors are confronted with the local reality. Son fils, de quatre mois, il est mort dans le tsunami. Il était devant la maison avec, quand la vague est arrivée et la vague a arraché le bébé de, de ses mains et l'a emporté. Some of the party are suddenly struck by the scale of the tragedy. The contrast is hard to bear. Yeah. Uh, this is a yeah, yeah. It's cette dame qui s'est pris uh, contre moi et to 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 the villagers didn't even receive first aid. Michel, 
stress. Yeah. Yeah, look, yeah, look, yeah, look, yeah, Le mur qui a écroulé, qui lui est tombé dessus. Faced with the scale of the disaster, Guy is disconcerted. On va essayer de faire une caisse, tu vois, chez Aventure Volcan, pour leur envoyer un peu d'argent quand même. J'y avais pensé un peu avant, mais tu sais, tant que t'es pas confronté vraiment à la situation, quand tu vois pas la misère des gens, bon, tu... mais là, franchement, tu peux pas rester insensible, tu dis, faut faire quelque chose quand même. Guy and his friends were the first to set foot on the new volcano. Their adventure has caused a scandal. The Indonesian energy minister has even banned them from staying in the area. In Bamyan, it's competition day for our tourists, but they will have to deal with local constraints. Blocked in by snow, dozens of vehicles are immobilized. The contestants will have to finish the journey on foot. All right, we'll see how this goes. Woo! But I guess it's fair because everyone is stuck down here, so everyone has to walk up. So it's a fair deal. This is Afghanistan race. Yeah, it's Afghanistan. I didn't expect any less. <laughs> The organization is a little shaky. But for the Afghans, the race is important. The 44 contestants have been training for months to beat the visiting foreigners, and especially to win the first prize, 10,000 Afghanis, or 110 euros, more than twice the average monthly salary in Afghanistan. <laughs> From the start, the difference is clear. The Afghans are running in deep snow. It's impossible for the foreigners to maintain the pace. Aside from the 350 meter climb of 4,000 meters, other obstacles are stacking up. The weather is closing in. The foreigners are struggling to keep up. They are still far behind when the first Afghan reaches the summit and begins his descent. The champion of the Afghan Ski Challenge 2019 finishes the race in 26 minutes. Meanwhile, at the summit, the first foreigners still have to prepare their equipment for the descent in an icy wind. Inga, the young Norwegian, has fallen far behind. I did a stupid idea and tried to sprint with the boys in the stars. I lasted for 100 meters. Then my body catch up with me. Suddenly, he collapses, seemingly paralyzed. The fatigue has caused an old shoulder injury to resurface. The young man can no longer move. Fortunately, Ellen, the American, is a doctor and has just arrived. Ellen soon manages to relocate his shoulder. But Inga will have to find the strength to go down, unaided. The Afghans reach the finish line. They're fast, but not the most technical. And finally, the first foreigners to cross the line are placed only 14th and 15th. Did it! We did it! Yeah! 
Good no Zaskinski challenge. Woo! Yeah. A quarter of an hour later, an exhausted Inga rejoins the team. It was chaos skinning up there, wasn't it? I thought, because I didn't think everyone would be that fast. I like, someone has to like, let go. But no, everyone is. The local. The Afghans' victory is well deserved. But the tourists have also earned their moment of glory. Their presence gives hope to this very struggling region. Despite the country's instability, Bamyan plans to attract more adventurers in the years to come. Elsewhere, some are not yet out of the woods. Romain and David are exhausted and without water. Their obstacle course continues in the Chernobyl nuclear exclusion zone. After more than 15 hours, a new goal has been reached. The site of one of the symbols of the Soviet Empire, Duga. Two huge antennas that served as an over-the-horizon radar during the Cold War. It's a bit of the recompense after 40 km of march. This is an endroit really exclusive. But there's a problem. This time, Igor wants to leave them here, and his advice is shocking. CNPP. 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 Yes. Chernobyl station. OK. They are still more than 20 kilometers from their final destination, but alone it's dangerous. You don't continue to the village? Ça va être probablement difficile hein, au, au vu de nos ressources. Ça va être... On a failli avoir un... de l'eau en plus, mais finalement on n'en aura pas. Et déjà ce qui nous reste, ça nous permettra juste de faire la, la moitié et encore. The two friends decide to give up. Their Chernobyl adventure ends here. But for others, the trip is far from over. The tourist agency's clients will now discover the Soviet antenna. We were definitely not on the radar. Under the radar, you might say. <laughs> I'm so glad you find yourself funny. For them, the city of Pripyat is just a 20-minute bus ride, and they will be given the full guided tour. The Soviet cinema, the gymnasium, the amusement park that was due to open four days after the disaster. Pripyat was a new city, a model of Soviet architecture. Today, there are trees everywhere, and all that's left is a ghost town. So we're in, a, in quite a big city, and there's not a sound, just the birds. The highlight of the visit is to get as close as possible to the origin of the disaster. Reactor number four of the nuclear power station. It's covered with a large containment dome the size of a football stadium. Not more than flying in. The tourists are won over. For the photos, they say, One, not cheese, two, three. but. Radiation! <laughs> and before leaving the premises, they must pass through the security portal with detectors that check their radioactivity levels, especially on their hands and feet. With nearly 100,000 visitors a year, Chernobyl has become the symbol of disaster tourism. But what will be the next step for our extreme adventurers? Space, most likely. From 2020, travel agencies will start offering stays in the space station.